So um, only one type of um, signal transduction pathway initiated by lipid-soluble chemical messengers, and that was gene activation. But there are four, I think, that um, you're going to learn that are activated by water-soluble chemical messengers because there are a lot more water-soluble chemical messengers. So where these um, chemical messengers, whether they're paracrine agents, hormones, neurotransmitters, whatever, where they are going to find their receptor is on the cell membrane because they're water soluble and they can't get inside the cell. Um, the types that we're going to go through, um, the first one you've already met a bunch of times. It is an ion channel receptor. It is a receptor for a chemical messenger that is also a ligand gated ion channel. Um, these are commonly called ionotropic receptors, and they cause the fastest postsynaptic, postsynaptic cell response. So the effect of the chemical messenger binding is going to be that an ion channel opens or closes on the target cell, causes a graded membrane potential, could be depolarizing or hyperpolarizing. And some examples that we have run into, whether you know it or not, is that nicotinic cholinergic receptors are the really fast ones that bind to acetylcholine and also nicotine. They're almost always excitatory, and um, here's one right here. This is a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. These are super important in the central nervous system and learning attention and memory. These are also the ones that degenerate in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, the next category is um, a cell membrane receptor still, but instead of this one functioning as an ion channel, it functions as an enzyme. The extracellular portion, portion is um, acts like a receptor and the intracellular portion acts like an enzyme. So when something binds to it, it activates this enzyme and then the enzyme does enzyme stuff inside the cell, activating a response that didn't exist before. And the biggest category of these are called tyrosine kinase receptors. And what they do is they kinase, phosphorylate, the tyrosine amino acid of a protein and therefore change its activity. So they add a phosphate group. Um, the end result is a difference in cell activity. Um, examples of these are um, one of the major insulin receptors works this way. Um, and then another category that isn't shown in your textbook pictures um, are kind of like this. This side is a receptor. This side is not the same protein um, in the JEK kinases, but it's bound to it. So it looks very much like this, only two separate proteins instead of bound proteins. And these are called JEK kinase receptors, and they're super duper common. Um, they kind of do the same thing, except it's not tyrosine. Growth hormone, prolactin, those work that way. And then the really complicated one are called the G-protein coupled receptors. And these are just like so hard to imagine how they evolved. Because, um, so here's the receptor. Here's the thing that you want to cause a different activity on. And then here's three other proteins that are involved in the process somehow. Um, in Texas, we would call that going around your ass to get to your elbow. Here's another example. Muscarinic cholinergic receptors work this way. So here's the receptor. Alpha, beta, and is that gamma? I can't remember. Um, are in the membrane. These slide through and smack into that ion channel or this thing right here to open it. And as weird as they are, they're super common. Muscarinic cholinergic receptors, alpha adrenergic receptors, beta adrenergic receptors, and serotonin receptors mostly work this way. So there's an animation linked right here, and that's kind of a longer one, and it goes through G-protein and tyrosine kinase. But I want to show you this one that's short and a little easier to look at. So here's your ion channel that you want to open or close. Here's the ligand, here's the receptor, and here's these guys, right? So watch what happens. The receptor site on the outside of the cell membrane, the G protein changes conformation, and guanosine triphosphate replaces the guanosine diphosphate on the alpha subunit. These are called G protein receptors because they use GTP instead of ATP as their um, energy source. Of the G protein. The activated alpha subunit then separates from the beta and gamma subunits. The alpha subunit, with guanosine triphosphate attached, binds to the calcium ion channel, causing the calcium ion channel to open. Calcium ions diffuse into the cell and combine with calmodulin. 
you don't have to worry about calmodulin. But basically, instead of just um, using an ion channel receptor, you use an ion channel or you use a receptor plus one, two, three, four other proteins to accomplish the same thing. It's difficult to figure out how this evolved, but they are really, really common. Okay, so different ways to cause the postsynaptic cell to do something, but what is the something? What does the cell do after all of the signal transduction? Well, it's different for different cells and different um, chemical messengers, but definitely the cell has a physiological change. So it could, uh, like here, activate transcription, causing synthesis of a protein that might be an enzyme. It could, like here, activate or deactivate an enzyme and therefore change activity. It could actually um, have an enzyme move in that causes um, secretion or cell division. It could hyperpolarize or depolarize the cell membrane and therefore excite or inhibit it. It could change the metabolic rate of the cell, but basically um, you did something new to the cell, so the cell behaves differently, okay? And that is the objective of signal transduction.